Is this thing on? I, I think we can kick off. Today I, I want to talk about a little on Alexander Hamilton and the American school. And then spend a little more time on Friedrich List. This is, if you like, the reaction. Yesterday, we, we looked at Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Hume, you know, the standard guys who said the mercantilists were wrong. And that specialization, division of labor, international trade is the source of wealth. And now we have a reaction. And the, the reaction, at some level, is political. Um, Hamilton was basically in there at the revolution. Okay? When America decides that it wants to ditch its links to the UK, um, he's one of the people who's with Washington. He's one of the founders of the republic. And he was a bit of a radical. And for him, the emphasis was on the United States becoming politically independent. And you know, his great expression, true political independence, is predicated on economic independence. Until America was economically independent, it wouldn't have what he wanted it to have. Now, he was an interesting character. We'll look at him a little more. But in fact, his ideas ended up being developed far further by people who came after him. He, there's a generation between these two. And there's another generation between him and Senator Clay, okay, Clay the Elder, Clay Senior, who was the person who really took the American school and, and ran with it. Um, and it was the, the essence of American trade policy for the first half of the 19th century. To be perfectly honest, the American school, the American approach to international trade ran for big chunks of the 19th century and large chunks of the 20th. Okay, When we think of America as a free trade nation, it's only in the sense that it's achieved what people like List wanted it to achieve. Um, American free trade is trade on their own terms, not everybody else's. Um, Friedrich List, very, very different. We'll, we'll look at some of his life history and see how it, it framed his thinking. But he was a man of much broader and much more sophisticated understanding. He isn't just some blind, semi-mercantilist, protectionist type. He was a man who was obsessed with getting his homeland up and moving. And his homeland was not the United States, although people think of him as being immensely influential. He was German. And he spent most of his life in Germany. He wrote some of his more interesting stuff when he was living in Philadelphia. But his, his kind of magnum opus is written in and for Germany. And his great aim was German unification. So Bismarck achieved a great deal. He would have achieved very, very little of it without the groundwork that was set for him by Friedrich List. Um, OK, so let's, let's have a, a look at these guys. Kick off with, with Hamilton. Now, this is now in the years immediately after the revolution. So the first problem after the revolution there was a need to counteract the effects of the UK Navigation Act. Now, we talked about the Navigation Act. The British Navigation Act required people to use British vessels if they were going to be trading British products in British ports. So anything that was going in or out of a port A in Britain or B in a British colony and wasn't traveling in a British vessel paid over the odds. And 
the Americans felt they needed to counteract the effects, but remember that each state in the United States at this stage thought of itself as something special. Each of them, although they were loosely bound, had its own rules and regulations, and they were very, very independent of each other. So you had this peculiar situation that each of them felt that the Navigation Acts were a pain in the neck. They each wanted to react to them in some way. But the southern states were agricultural states. They were agricultural exporters. They were perfectly happy to have a British vessel <laughs> you know, taking their cotton across to the other side of the world, where there was a market for it. And if those vessels brought British goods back, these were the things that they needed. That was fine. So they were dead happy to have really low tariffs. The northern states, the manufacturing states, had very little to export to Britain, but they did need stuff to come in. They'd had a bad sort of reputation with tea, but you know, they, they did nonetheless import stuff. But they were wanting to put in really high tariffs. The trouble is, that there's an internal traffic as well. So stuff could come in at low, low rates in the southern states and simply be shipped straight up to the north, bypassed. So it, there was this need to unify the tariff structure. And Hamilton spotted it and bought in the Tariff Act. And there were subsequent Tariff Acts in 1824, we'll see, sort of long after Hamilton was dead. Uh, Again, you know, unifying the tariffs across the nation, 20 to 25 percent, depending on the product, and there it was. He also had a report on manufacturers that he submitted to the Senate, in which he talked about the problem of having an economy which was largely agrarian. It wasn't just the southern states. The northern states, too, at this stage, had a strong emphasis on agriculture. And he had a notion which is absolutely central to list later, that manufacturing and agriculture are symbiotic. That if you have a strong agricultural sector, it strengthens your manufacturing. And you need a strong manufacturing sector for your agriculture to really work. You're growing all these farm goods. Who are you going to? Who are you going to sell them to? If everybody is planting, the market is limited. What you need, in fact, is a specialist, viable, thriving manufacturing sector to consume the goods of agriculture and to provide them with their inputs. The plows, the harrows, and so on and so forth need to be made by someone. Um, and he suggests protective duties on manufacturers, but not on primary inputs. And we'll see again that this is something that Friedrich List himself later picks up on and adopts. OK, and I mentioned that he, Hamilton dies fairly young. OK, moral of the story, don't enter into duels with people who actually shoot at you. I mean, he was supposed to be doing the gentlemanly thing and kind of going like this, and he, bad mistake. Um, Clay's American system comes in a generation later, and we see tariffs coming in, but a series of other characteristics. The American system required stability and Again, we'll see later that this was something that, that List recognized, adopted, and transshipped back to Europe. In order for an economy to really grow, you need to have the minimum possible level of risk and uncertainty. It needs to be stable. That means you've got to get rid of issues of war. It's got to be peaceful. It's got to be stable. And at the heart of stability is financial stability. Now, for as long as you have a system of private banks, unregulated, 
you're, you're hanging yourself up on a rifle range for people to shoot at. Really, you need a system of stable finance, and that requires a central bank of some sort. The original Bank of the United States came in shortly after independence. There was now a need, for, but it was done away with. There was now a need to bring in a new one. The second Bank of the United States was modeled on the Bank of England. Um, and the idea was simply to stabilize the dollar and reduce the risk of bank runs, bank instability. And then there was infrastructure. And again, we'll see this heavy overlap with Friedrich List. Need for canals, need for roads, later on, a need for rail. In order for the economy to really grow, you need to reduce the cost of moving stuff between markets. And developing infrastructure is expensive. The question came, how would you pay for it? Well, the two obvious ways. One, you would have tariffs on your imports. It was going to be the basic source of funding for the new government. But the second source was the one thing the United States had in abundance was land. Now, later on, we see things like the Homestead Acts, which were dishing out land for free to people who would use it. But early on, the US government recognized the possibility that they could raise large amounts of money for themselves by selling land, virgin land, to new immigrants. And so the real problem was to keep up the price of land. And part of the American system was finding ways of artificially s supporting land prices. Um, right. So let's go on a bit, just so that you can see what's going on. These were the days when each president's inaugural address actually said something. And remember that the War of 1812 between the United States and Britain uh, was quite nasty. I mean, Washington was shelled. The White House was damaged. Um, and fairly shortly after, so literally four and a half years after the War of 1812, Monroe gives his first, now this is the same Monroe as the Monroe Doctrine. Um, he says something really interesting. Uh, he says, possessing as we do all the raw materials, the fruit of our own soil industry, we ought not to depend in the degree we have done on supplies from other countries. While we are thus dependent, the sudden event of war, uncertain and unexpected, cannot fail to plunge us to the most serious difficulties. In other words, there's a strategic reason for having protection. Okay, and this whole thing is about the rationale for protecting domestic industry as a strategic necessity. What's really interesting is how this changes by the time you get to his second inaugural address. So here we are, soon after the war. A few years later, much the same sort of arguments are phrased very, very differently. He's, he's now talking about the need to raise money. This is not for strategic purposes. This is not so that we're vulnerable to the English. It's, it's so that we can raise money. And he's saying, um, the provision of revenue to meet to a certain extent the demands of the nation without relying altogether on the precarious resource of foreign commerce. I'm satisfied that internal duties and excises with cor corresponding Im imposts on foreign articles of the same kind would do the job. In other words, he's saying we need to have domestic taxes sales tax, basically, and tariffs. And these are going to fund us. But the emphasis is no longer on protection. It's no longer on stability. 
on, uh, on strategy. It's all about raising money. Things have changed. Um, OK. So we now move on to the person who, for me, is the, the really exciting character. And I'm just going to run through some features of his life just that you can put him into context. And List is way more tragic a figure than Hamilton. Hamilton had a pretty good life until the very end. List, List went through hell. If you, there are a couple of good biographies of him, and they, they really are interesting. Because he was an interesting man. He has the same name as the composer. The composer used to come and have dinner with him. They weren't related. Composer tried to seduce his daughter. Sedu daughter sent him off with a flea in his ear. But you know, it, there are all sorts of interesting aspects to the man. Um, he, he was born in, in Reutlingen, which is in Baden-Württemberg, um, and went off as an academic to Tübingen. Um, And was actually bored stiff. He wanted to be doing real things. And so he joined the civil service. Now, the idea that the civil service is more exciting than academia, frankly, is a bit, bit surprising. But he went there and did extremely well. While he was working in the civil service, he spotted a whole bunch of sources of inefficiency. He saw, in fact, that the civil service was a dog's breakfast that people were unaccountable, people were corrupt, there were all sorts of problems, there was no proper bookkeeping being done, and he brought in a series of reforms, was very successful at them, made himself very unpopular with a lot of people, and then left the civil service and went into the Chamber of Deputies, which was, if you like, the this was a principality, so the, the parliamentary system was limited in its powers. But the Chamber of Deputies did have some say. And he proceeded to suggest that things in the, in the entire principality were being run inefficiently. He explained that the system of tariffs was a barrier to trade. Not just international trade, but domestic trade. The tolls and so on and so forth, all through Germany at this stage, were costing. He made this point very forcefully, and for his troubles was arrested. He was sentenced to nine months of hard labor, jumped the country, eventually figured that he would come back and serve out the time he did, was rearrested, and negotiated that if he left the country, they would suspend the charges. So he left the country, went first to France, then went over to the United States. And he became a farmer <clears throat> in Pennsylvania. Became a farmer and started running a local newspaper became friendly with the local politicians, picked up on these ideas of the American system, and started developing them. He then gave a series of talks, one of which was to the local Chamber of Commerce in Philadelphia, where he basically ripped into Adam Smith. And this was the start of it. Ripping into Adam Smith made him very, very popular with the American establishment. Because Britain at this stage was the dominant trading power. It was the dominant industrial power. The Industrial Revolution had taken off earlier in Britain than anywhere else. So the British manufacturers were better, cheaper, in all ways superior to those of any other nation. And so he said, well, it's not surprising, is it? that Adam Smith and David Ricardo and the boys are telling us that what we need to do is have free trade. 
he gets quite friendly with Andrew Jackson, who offers him the, uh, the American mission uh, in Leipzig. And he goes over there, finds that the locals don't really accept him. He sticks it out for nine or 10 months. But in fact, if Germany doesn't recognize him, he's got a problem. Why was Germany not recognizing him? First of all, because the chaps in Württemberg hadn't forgotten. And secondly, because he was now saying things that Metternich didn't like. Now, picking a fight with the Prince of Baden-Württemberg is one thing. Picking a fight with Metternich, who was basically running everything from Austria all the way through to the Elbe, is, is very, very different. Um, you're really on a hiding to nothing. Um, so he battles. But fortunately, he's made a bit of money in the States. He is able to survive. He runs a few newspapers and things, and eventually starts writing. He writes some stuff in France. He was a multilingual because he was writing in French and German and English. And then writes what's now known as this, the national system of political economy. And this is what people really remember him for. But then gets into financial difficulties, becomes a depressive, and, and kills himself at a fairly young age. OK, let's just run through some of his ideas. And one of them is the notion of intellectual and social capital. Now, in his approach to the work of Adam Smith, part of the critique is the critique of, of, well, of absolute advantage and of Ricardo's comparative advantage. But part of it is in the notion that wealth does not constitute the simple physical capacity to produce in some static sense. He said wealth is embodied in, in the intellectual and social capital of the nation, and that means something very different. And he used to give the example of two fathers. Both of them have a thousand marks in hand. One of them takes the 1,000 marks and puts it in the bank at interest and sends his son off to become a day laborer. The other one takes the 1,000 marks and invests it in the education of his son. The first one, in terms of income during his life, is likely to do far better. He's earning the interest, and his son is feeding himself. But in terms of long-term prospects, Liz said the investment in human capital is always going to be a winner. So at a private level, he says, Smith isn't really recognizing this distinction. I think he's actually being a bit hard on Smith, to be honest. But he makes the point. He then says there's also a public dimension, that the capacity of a country to produce is not just down to its raw materials and its physical labor. There's also an infrastructure, a system of rules, regulations, law. Um, he even goes on and talks about Christian culture. He's, in a sense, anticipating Weber. Um, it's, it's really interesting. He talks about the entrepreneurial spirit, the patents, the inventions. Um, basically, the institutional structure of a nation is what determines how productive given factors of production are going to be. And he says, that's why you need government. It's government that gives you those aspects. Now, for Smith, the best government is the least government. And you rely on people to do what's in their own best interest. But 
he say? There's a lot that individual people don't pick up on. The public goods, if you like, but also the kind of institutional externalities. Now, we can try and formalize this. He, he talks about the three types of economy. He talks about private economy, national economy, and the economy of mankind. Now, he's very clear. Adam Smith is great on the private. Every man doing what's, doing what's in his own best interest subject to the norms and mores of the society. He's clear that Adam Smith is really good on the third one. That society, global society, benefits through free trade. That trade and specialization in the division of labor actually benefit the globe. But, he says, people don't live in the globe. People live in nation states. And individual nation states, he says, can lose out. That this for him is, is the glaring hole in Smith's logic. He leaves out number two. So what's the issue? Well, he says there's no question about man looking after his own interests. Smith is absolutely right there. Um, but he says man looks after himself and his immediate family. Man very rarely thinks about his long-term descendants and certainly does, doesn't think about the descendants of other people. So we need someone who's going to think about the long-term interests of the nation. That's the government. And it's, it's a notion that the state politicians are people who are presumably wise enough and broad-minded enough to think about the interests of all. I'm not totally persuaded that all politicians fit the bill, but this was his ideal world. And this notion that the invisible hand can work globally but not nationally is down to a few things, and, and he gives these as examples. Um, so he says, first of all, if everyone is doing what's in their own best interests, you can have a situation of extremely asymmetric income distribution. And he says, it matters. A world in which there are sort of discrepancies between rich and poor is not going to be one that is really happy or really sustainable. Then he talks about the paradox of thrift. In other words, for an individual to get rich, the individual saves. But if everybody saves, the economy goes into a decline. Again, you need a nation state to direct patterns of saving and expenditure. Then he says, what about speculation? Okay, a speculator if he strikes it lucky, does really well. But if you have a nation with a habit of speculation, you end up A, damaging others, and B, damaging the society. Then he talks about infrastructure. You know, he's now introducing the notion of what we would today call pecuniary externalities. Now, if, if you have, and, and this is, this is a current example rather than his example, um, because he, he talks about people running barges. <laughs> but, um, if you have a good railway system, and he was living at the time that railways were just kicking off, and he was obsessed with railways. He was way ahead of his time. If you introduce a good railway system, yes, the people who are running carts and so on and so forth will lose out. Nonetheless, it's a good thing to have. Okay? And to have it, you may well need the prompt 
of a viable state. Otherwise, it may just never come. Then he anticipates Schumpeter, creative destruction. Um, he says, every, every invention may be disadvantageous for certain people. New stuff always hurts somebody. But society as a whole will be blessed by it. And then he talks about the impact of trade. He says, you can kill a local industry while importers get rich. And this is what people remember him for, but the rest is really important. Okay, now, it's not as if Adam Smith had said that tariffs have no place. I mentioned yesterday that Smith finished his days as, as a controller of customs. He, he was collecting basically import duties. He was well aware that there is a place for tariffs, but it's quite interesting what he says those places are. You are entitled, Smith says, to have protective tariffs if you need them as an instance of retribution, if someone is sort of basically playing fast and loose by subsidize, well, if they're penalizing imports from you, you need to get back at them. Um, and there are all sorts of restrictions on trade. In other words, if people are being mercantilist in your direction, you need to be able to smack them down. Tariffs will do that. He also talks about security. So again, the kind of strategic argument that we saw Hamilton using, that if there are industries which are necessary for the security of the state, you should be prepared to protect them by using tariffs. And Lastly, if people are dumping stuff by having either subsidies or especially low taxes, so on and so on, and you've got to level the playing field, Smith recognizes that this is a justified reason for having tariffs. What's interesting is that although List is quite happy with the middle one, he has major problems with the other two. Okay, and his view is really different. First of all, he says, let's get the big picture right. That freedom and peace are the prerequisites for the wealth of nations. And Look at that first sentence. I mean, that, this is classic mercantilism. Remember we said the mercantilists were people whose obsession was with the power of the nation state. And he says, this is the first priority of politics. And he says, the more you've got, the more you have to protect it. The better things look, the more you have to fear your loss of independence. And then he says, a reasonable tariff is the main prerequisite for providing a high degree of economic security. The more a nation provides continuity in the market with respect to prices, wages, profit, the more it will facilitate the development of its productive resources. Put very simply, someone that I knew up in Zimbabwe many years ago said to me, we live in a world of risk and uncertainty. Risk is what happens when you can put probabilities on events. Uncertainty is when you can't. A businessman's business is to take risks. He calculates the odds, and he takes a risk, and profit is the reward for taking risk. But a businessman confronted by uncertainty, when the probability is unknown, takes his plans, takes his money, puts it all in the bottom drawer, and waits for times to change. So List is basically saying you can use your tax system to stabilize the economy, to reduce the uncertainties, and encourage investment. OK, 
Now, we've said that Adam Smith had ideas about tariffs. What does List have to say? Well, he says, first of all, primary commodities, primaries don't require protection. Minerals, agriculture, timber, fisheries, forget it. These are things that you can do for yourself anyway. What you need to do is to broaden the base of the economy. And in broadening the base, there may be a case. He's not saying there absolutely is. There may be a case. OK. So if you have manufacturers that could progress but are being held back by foreign competition, then you can have a tariff. But the tariff must be clearly defined. The duration of the tariff and the, and the level at which the tariff is pegged have to be clearly set out, made public. And the aim is not for this tariff to continue in perpetuity. It's going to decline. He's quite interesting on the subject of equipment and machinery. Capital goods, in general, he says, should be duty free. You want to encourage investment, and if you have to bring in the equipment from overseas, bring it in duty free, unless someone is trying to start up an equipment manufacturing business locally, and there's sufficient of a market. In which case, you protect them until they've got themselves going. And the important thing, the tariff has to be predefined, time specified. And there must be no likelihood of ad hoc changes. Now, that's really important because Smith's idea of tariffs, retributive tariffs, OK, somebody else is doing something to you, so you try and smack them down. These are going to be ad hoc. They're going to come in. They're going to, you know, when the chap has changed his mind and is behaving himself, you then take the tariff away. This, according to List, is going to destabilize the economy. The last thing you want is an unstable tariff system. Now, the point of it is that at the heart of manufacturing capacity is, is this idea of human capital. To be really productive, you don't just need machines. You need people who have skills. And those skills have to be acquired over time. So while your workers and your management are on a learning curve, they need protection. Once they've done the learning and they've established themselves, their factories are up and running, then the protection can be lifted. So you need to estimate how long it's going to take them and then have the tariffs coming in the rates are preset, but the duration is also preset. You're not here to protect people in perpetuity. And how do we identify them? Well, he says, in any economy, there will be key industries. I mentioned yesterday that there were aspects that sounded very, very similar to Leontief, the, the economic um, Nobel Prize winner of some years back, um, that you have linkages. Albert Hirschman with his development ideas, same sort of idea. Key industries have links to the rest of the economy. If you can stimulate those industries, you stimulate the rest of the economy. In South Africa, if you stimulate engineering, civil engineering in South Africa, you stimulate huge swathes of the rest of the economy. Build a few bridges and a few roads, and it's astonishing how much of an impact you'll have on the rest of the economy. Um, so he says, first of all, identify the key industries that would benefit the rest of the economy and need to develop. Then he says there's no point in protecting labor using what you want to do is to identify those that are capital intensive because capital is expensive. No one is going to take the risk 
of investing in large amounts of capital unless they feel secure. So you've got to give them that security. And you want to identify areas where there's a steep learning curve. If the learning curve is long and slow, you're going to be protecting them forever. So be selective about the industries you protect. Do it for a limited duration. And above all, he says, don't waste your time in a small economy. This is a system that is there for economies with a large domestic market. So the United States, fantastic. Greater Germany, fantastic. A small principality in Germany, please. Okay. It was for that reason that he later went on and put all of his efforts into the Zollverein. Okay, the German Customs Union, trying to minimize the barriers to trade internally in Germany so that you would have the basis for greater German unification. Um, <clears throat> so Brazil, China, India, the United States, you know, countries with large populations, large domestic markets, are classic cases for this sort of approach. And we'll see that this is very much what China has done. Would it fit South Africa? Well, to be perfectly honest, we have a large enough population that perhaps it might. Certainly the idea of a Southern African customs union that really worked would make a lot of sense. <clears throat> if you look at the total population and total potential spending power of Africa south of the Congo, that's, a, that's potentially a very big market. And the idea of a, a Southern African customs union which has money to spend where industries are protected until they get going, does make a certain amount of sense. And above all, people tend to dismiss Friedrich List as just another sort of mercantilist protectionist sort with all the others. He was anything but. Okay, List had a, a broader vision. Okay, he talked about the five economic conditions of society. And he says all societies start off with what he called original barbarism. But you want to evolve. He talked about barbarism, the pastoral, the pastoral condition, the agricultural condition, agricultural manufacturing, agricultural manufacturing, and, and, and commercial. And for each, he says, Trade can offer a way out. To get out of barbaric conditions, the barbarian has something that he can offer for sale. And he benefits from free trade with people who are willing to take it from him and give him the things that he needs that he can't produce for himself. So in the state of original barbarism, he says you want free trade. Free trade is what lifts you out. If you're in a pastoral economy, what you have is sheep and goats. You need free trade to give you the stuff that you need. You give them your animals, they give you their manufactures. You benefit. Once you become agricultural, that's when you need to progress. And progression is going to require the evolution of, an, of a manufacturing sector. And that's going to require some protection. You don't protect agriculture. You protect the manufacturing. And once you have agriculture and manufacturing, again, you need to develop. You need to have invisibles. You need insurance. You need banking. You need all sorts of commerce. And again, you may well need protection. 
But once you have a broad-based, diversified, productive, efficient economy, do you need to protect anybody? Of course not. At that point, he says, you're where Adam Smith was in Britain looking at the rest of the world. At that point, you encourage free trade. Because at that point, free trade between equals benefits everyone. Free trade between unequals is problematic. So the aim of protection is evolution of the economy to a position where protection is no longer needed. And there we go. Right. On the dot, 45 minutes. Gentles, questions? So really, you're arguing an immature economy is very different from a mature one. Uh, uh, and the other thing I wanted to raise with you is, is the question of, having said all of that, uh, what we've seen with Brexit and Trump is really the consequences, it seems to me, of the uh, unequal uh, uh, effects of globalization, which maybe calls for some kind of state so, intervention, and regionally. This is the great conundrum. We know that if you have an underdeveloped economy, there's a case to be made for protection in order to achieve development. But if you have a developed economy and you have elected to take away jobs, so the United States has sacrificed millions of jobs in manufacturing, <coughs> literally millions. Is it possible to take them back? You've given them to China. Can you now reverse the process? You had them yes. once upon a time. Two generations. So, but they gave them up in the space of a few of a few years. Well, the Washington plan to some extent to that with Germany and Japan at the expense of America. Are you also uh, talking about going back to one of your points <coughs> about disruptive technologies? I mean, America today is intellectual capital, IT, and all the other, the widgets and everything have gone, the textiles have gone. And he wants to bring back he heavy industry. You know, <laughs> will, will the steel belt of the United States ever be really competitive? Unless they find the iron ore. <laughs> I, I, I would think uh, to, to use something I don't think is right in South Africa, but might be in very case, is that America may be a classic case, we're not for trying to bring, bring back the rest of us, but, but for um, uh, raising minimum wage because you've got more lot of McDonald's jo jobs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is a state intervention, obviously. I know it's very controversial, but, but it's, it's, you know, it's obviously not tariffs as such, but it is another kind of state intervention. Actually, we're going to be, we're going to be getting there tomorrow and the oh. day after. Okay. <laughs> Just remind me, what's, sorry, what's tomorrow? Uh, Thursday. No, 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 <laughs> to, tomorrow, talking about Singer Prebish and to an extent some of the unequal uh, unequal exchangey stuff. It's basically the the modern theory of opposition to specialization and opposition. the international division of labor. So the we're, we're, uh, today we were looking at 19th century mm -hmm. approaches. 
to why Smith and Ricardo were wrong. There's also a body of 20th century approaches. Some of them are Marxist, and some of them are from just regular old, sort of slightly lefty economists. Um, but if you think back to, uh, do you remember the battle in Seattle when sort of the American public went completely berserk about globalization? And the rest of the world looked on and sort of thought, you know, surely America has benefited more from globalization than any other nation. But in fact, they were seeing something that Trump has subsequently picked up on. Um, it's, it's really interesting how he's, he's identified what the great American public is worried about. Um, so we're going to be looking at these kind of broad brush. Basically, since the Second World War, you've had the World Bank and the IMF on the one side saying specialized trade, comparative advantage, all that stuff. And a whole host of others saying, mm, maybe not quite. So we're going to discuss. Sorry, there was a... Um, tariffs at, at this time were the sole revenue for the state. We didn't have income taxes. The income tax was something that only came in very, very slowly. So in Britain, the first income tax, I think, was William Pitt. Am I right? I think, I think Pitt. I'm just thinking that this was looking at tariffs as a way to enhance the economy. Mm. But the state also has a need Absolutely. to raise revenue. So, and, and he was very aware of it. And certainly Hamilton was aware of it. Um, and we saw from Monroe's sort of second inaugural, um, the idea of a president who actually says in his inaugural address that he's sort of dead keen on keeping up taxes uh, is, is unusual. Um, and, sorry, and just to go back to the question about developed and less developed countries, would you say that, say, countries like Zambia, these days, are heavily dependent on import taxes as opposed to VAT a, taxes? A lot of countries that are primary commodity exporters actually rely on export taxes as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we don't really think of an export tax, but if what you're doing is exporting copper or oil or shove a tax on it as it goes up. Um, and could that influence which economic model you want to adopt, whether you want to be more uh, well, mercantilist? One of, one of the interesting features of Zambia is that it does have this, this narrow base. That Zambia's economy is is a, a pyramid upside down. You know, copper is supporting everything else. And yet its agriculture, its agricultural potential is enormous. Um, it's, it used to have quite serious manufacturing potential up on the copper belt because there were lots of industrial foundries and so on and so forth. Therefore the mines. Um, and Zambia's economy has actually slimmed down rather than broadening. Instead of, the, instead of having a, a broader base, it, it's actually been narrowing itself. And that, that really is the last thing that you want. Um, I suppose your comment about Sadak being sufficiently large. Um, I lived in Haberoni on and off for about four years and changed a number of Sadak meetings in Haberoni. Um, the problem is that the South African government uh, does not want to have a free trade area. Uh, we know there's two moves to open a car manufacturing operation in Haberoni and each time it was closed down because the South African government said we will not allow a single vehicle to be imported from 
Well, and Ian Comer has been muttering Sarabia. about it. Uh, and um, Zaranga is viewed from outside, with its Zadak from outside, as being a totally protectionist economy. Yes. Um, many of the industries in South Africa would love to migrate elsewhere within Sadak and sell back into South Africa, particularly get rid of the trade union problems, uh, to be able to deal with, if you like, the EE, to do the whole range of, of issues which uh, we do it. So I think it's a long starter um, because of the um, uh, how easy it would be to manufacture outside South Africa within Sadak and to export back in. One of the great mistakes, if you like, of Robert Mugabe's administration was when he came in in 1980, he had a nice, solid, diversified economy. And he could have opened the doors and encouraged South African manufacturers to come in. Because this was, you know, 77 had kicked the South African economy in the teeth. And, and he had the option of going free market or going for a socialist system. And he opted for Zimbabwean-style socialism. Um, I, I really believe, you know, with, with no, in fact, not, I knew then, not benefit of hindsight, it was one of the major mistakes of, uh, of Southern Africa. But you're right, the South African economy actually doesn't have a great reputation in the rest of, in the rest of Africa. Sure. Um, but, but the potential for a free trade zone should be there, yeah. uh, you know, with with the right, with with recognition of the potential. There's there's so much that could happen, uh, but certainly, I mean, the Botswanans at the moment are, are actually really upset with South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, and justifiably. Thanks. Mm -hmm. A couple of days ago, I, I had breakfast with the, the British um, Commission of Trade, and uh, when faced with the competition from China, he said that what Britain hopes to do is to uh, go up the value chain, up the value chain, up the value chain, and sort of overcome, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is, the thing is, when you look at Trump, and you look at what's very, very important now, that I believe we're going to be are after the protectionist uh, measures across across the world, is that not everyone can move up the value chain. That work in the so-called rust belts in, in America cannot become a software engineer Google. Mm -hmm. and, and as as computers become more and more sort of sort, sort of competing uh, with human intelligence, I think that that's going to be more and more so. So I think that the rust belt could become the shiny belt again. I think that what what people will realize and are realizing is that if we prepare to take a lower wage, uh, we can actually compete with um, the. Um, the, the, the Chinese in, in steel manufacturing and, and so on, uh, provided that, uh, and they're not doing it right now, but they were for years and years doing currency manipulation. Mm -hmm. so I think Trump has got a tremendous, a tremendous amount of, uh, of kudos there and, and, and insights, and it's very unpopular and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes I just think that this whole IMF, you know, people go and protest against the IMF and want it out, you know, it's all to the interests of people who are really super specialized, they open trade and so on. And, and a country like the United States is not really a country, it's so big, they're countries within countries, and the end of which are really backward and are, and are, and are struggling backward, but really struggling in terms of the unemployment and so on. And, um, you know, I'm not sure that, that, that this laissez faire free trade of, of what's going on in the world is actually the best thing for even a large super manufacturing country and, and, and economically advanced country like the United States. So I, I'm afraid that I see this whole trust towards protect, protectionism is coming back in a very good way all across the world. The, the interesting thing, when you talk about moving up the value chain, I was thinking, you know, poor Britain, they think they're going to do this. The Italians got there a long time ago. Yeah. You know, Italian handbags, Italian shoes, Italian belts, Italian design. The Chinese make the cheap stuff that the rest of the world consumes. The Italians make the designer stuff that a very small cohort of the world buys. Um, but you can't have millions of people working for Gucci. Um, you know, it just doesn't work. Can I just 
there is, I mean, some question of, of the artificiality of this debate about free trade in the sense of, I mean, when I was covering America, uh, the subsidization by the Republicans is enormous. Yes. European, I mean, if we could 